What's up, everyone, and welcome to Movie Emporium's Flashback Reviews, where I take movies from the past, break them down, and tell you what I think about them. If you like what you see, of course, hit the subscribe button, join Movie Emporium, hit that notification bell, top to find out what's coming next, and uh, comment below on any video that you watch on my channel. So, what do we talk about this week? Um, there's not really any anniversary movies coming out this week. There's no movies in the theater at this moment. And I have wanted to keep it light and funny. Um, so a movie I'm going to be talking about today, as you saw in the intro to my video, is considered a comedy cult classic. Um, it's not necessarily the greatest that Mel Brooks has ever done. Uh, but it is pretty close. It is very, very funny. And it's a movie that has a lot of great actors. Um, there's a couple actors that are sorely missed, you know, because they've either passed on and so on and so forth. And this movie is just, it's a fun time. You don't have to really think about it. It's a spoof of Star Wars. It's a movie that just does so much with its material that Mel Brooks is known for doing. He's known for taking movies, doing spoofs like Blazing Saddles. Or, you know, um, uh, Young Frankenstein or something like that. And this movie, Spaceballs, is just something kind of just fun and energetic. It has a lot of great moments in it. There's so many great moments in it that it's one of the most quotable movies you've ever watched in your entire life. Um, it didn't make a lot of money, as Mel Brooks movies don't. But it has become one of those films that you can literally watch any day, any time. You watch on repeat and just have a good time with it. And it just has such an amazing cast. I mean, this movie is as perfect as a spoof of Star Wars as you can get. There are space battles, there are heroes, there are villains, there are outlandish moments, outlandish space moments. It's just a movie that has a very unique tone to it, a very unique texture to it. And Mel Brooks, you know, this is the first film I've uh, done in the flashback review of his films. Um, I wanted to talk about this film most of all because it's a film outside of maybe Blazing Saddles that I've watched the most of his. Um, History of the World Part 1 is also another film that I want to talk about eventually. So how do you talk about a movie like Spaceballs? You basically have to talk about the characters and kind of the ideas and the nature of these characters in general because for a movie like this to work, you have to have great, well-written characters. And the one thing Mel Brooks has always been good with and with his writing staff or whoever he helps write him write the movies is writing some like memorable scenes that these characters can play off of and how they act and interact with these scenes and you know the interactions with like the moments where the you know the villains had to play off the heroes and the heroes have to play off the villains you know you had to have the interesting set pieces and that's why comedic timing and comedy comedian movies or comedy movies will fail a lot of times because the moments that the directors are giving these actors to play off of it's such a hard thing to do that Mel Brooks has become one of the comedic geniuses of our time for that reason, because he's so good at his timing and getting his you know actors to do what he needs to do to prove his point of you know the set piece, whether it be funny or not. And uh, starting with, we'll go straight to the villains in this movie. Um, the first one to talk about is George Weiner. I'm going to kind of go up through the ranks because it's, I think it's a much better way to talk about this movie. Uh, George Weiner plays Colonel Sanders and Colonel Sanders is an amazing character in his own right. You know, if it weren't for Rick Moranis and Dark Helmet, uh, I would think this would be one of the great villains in comedic history because he's so skittish. And the fact that his name is Colonel Sanders and the fact that they actually do go towards the, are you chicken Colonel Sanders is an amazing thing to watch because George Weiner has always been an amazing actor to watch, whether it be in dramatic roles or comedic roles. You know, he's just so talented. Watching him be so skittish around um, Dark Helmet, watch him, like, you know, freak out when Dark Helmet wants something. He's like, I don't think we should do this, but Dark Helmet is so, like, so small minority complex. It's just, it's a beautiful thing to watch. You know, there are moments in here where, you know, Dark Helmet wants to know who cause the issues and he says it's an asshole and he's like you know I, who's his name because it's based off the you know who's on first he's like no there's the guy's last name is asshole and he's like how many assholes do we have on this ship and he's like everybody's like yo and it's just a it's an amazing sequence but that's the kind of stuff that george weiner is dealing with he is like kind of the the guy the more level-headed comedian in this movie you know mark Marinus is more the outlandish comedian but george weiner is like kind of the guy that is more level-headed, he's more the Moff Tarkin, he's more in charge of the day-to-day -day operations that, you know, Dark Helmet is more of like the, kind of the the mid-tier, like the vice president, and George uh, Weiner's character is more like, you know, the guy just in charge of the fleet when, when Dark Helmet's not around, but in this movie, it's just, George Weiner is just fantastic. I mean, there's not much else to say about him. 
And then we uh, we move into uh, probably the the standout of the movie outside of you know nobody else, uh, Rick Moranis, who plays Dark Helmet. Um, I know this is kind of early to talk about him because he's such an amazing character actor in his own right. But I have to not not you know kind of lead off with him because Rick Moranis is one of those actors. He came from SEC TV. He was in Ghostbusters as Louis Tully. He was in Honey I Shrunk the Kids as Wayne Zelinsky. Uh He's done a lot of other things, you know, Strange Brew and stuff like that. He's an actor that is on. You can't you can't find anybody like him. He's such a unique actor in his own right, and how he how he does things and how he acts towards. His character parts, his comedic timing with like people like Steve Martin and Martin Short is something that is it makes him an incredible piece of talent. And the fact that he left is such a sad thing to watch. But the reason he did it is for a noble reason to take care of his kids because, you know, of course, his wife passed away. But Dark Helmet is one of the legends in comedy as a character. He is so on point. As being that over the top, you know, kind of like um, the uh, John Lithgow character, the you know, the Prince Farquhar in uh, Shrek. He is a guy that is a very small statured character, a very small statured villain, but he makes up for it in his over the top, overzealous nature that he is in this movie. When I talk about perfect comic timing, this is perfect comic timing. You watch how Rick Moranis acts when he is put in a situation, for instance, when he is uh, chasing after the, you know, Lone Star and Barf, and he, uh, they go into uh, hyperactive overdrive, you know, hyperspace, and he's like, we need to go uh, ludicrous speed, and then George Weiner, um, uh, Colonel Sanders, is like, you know, if we do that, we're gonna go past them, and you know, but Dark Helmet is so focused and so just over insane in his logic of thinking he says do it you know colonel sanders buckles himself up he's like you need to buckle yourself up he's like buckle this. You know, the dark helmet goes buckle this he puts in ludicrous speed and he starts flying he starts like raising off the ground kind of like uh arnold schwarzenegger in total recall which is it's amazing amazing stuff because they start to go past <laughs> they start to go past uh, Barf and Lone Star, and all of a sudden they go to Plaid, which isn't. It doesn't make any sense. The whole idea of what they're doing doesn't make any sense. But when they finally get out of the ludicrous speed, basically Rick Moranis' Dark Helmet character flies into the console, and it is amazing. He wakes up. He's like, uh, "Let me know when we find him." You know, he's all like disheveled, probably has a concussion and stuff like that, and it's just. I laugh my ass off when I see stuff like that because there are so many great moments with Dark Helmet in this movie. There's, for instance, you know him playing with his dolls, the you know the asshole scene, um, the father's brother's second roommate, and you cannot not love what Rick Moranis is just doing in this movie with you know Mel Brooks' script. You know there are points where. <laughs> Uh, like when he's in the desert and like he's like comb the desert and we're like using big combs and stuff like that and he's like he's this big helmet on like big sand helmet it's like ah uh, god he's like one of the best comedic villains in history for a reason you know there's so many great moments there's like the mr coffee stuff there's the jam stuff there's a point where he drinks coffee and it like uh, he's drinking and all of a sudden his helmet falls down he's like it's too hot <laughs> And then, like I said, they watch the Spaceball video and like they're watching themselves now. He's like trying to do the who's on first thing. And this is why Rick Moranis is great stuff in this movie and why he's doing such a great job in this movie in general. So, you know, I, I would go on more about Rick Moranis. I'd probably do a 40 minute video, an hour video just on Rick Moranis in general about how talented he is. But this is a movie review about Spaceball. So we had to talk about the other characters. But uh, the other villain is President Screw, who is, of course, played by director Mel Brooks. Um, this is a pretty standard role for Mel Brooks. This is him doing his shtick where, you know, he, he's good at playing off himself. He's good at like, uh, reading his script and he's good at timing in, in general. If you look at, you know, history of the world part one, you look at his role in blazing saddles. It's very, very similar where he's kind of a airhead in a lot of ways, but he has a lot of great moments. Like for instance, when he's, when he's sniffing the, uh, the, uh, Perrier air can or when he's, you know, in bed with a couple of women and stuff like that. And when um, he does <laughs> the best sequence that he's involved with is when he goes into 
the the teleporter is snotty which is of course scotty teleports him and of course he's teleported with his head backwards and his whole body is like you can see his ass and stuff like that which is really funny the only bad part the only thing that kind of gives it away that it's kind of a messed up effect is his hands are the same direction as his, as his body so you can tell that they kind of put a suit over him, which is a little bit of a disappointment. But you know, to see him kind of be like the uh, be like the uh, Emperor Palpatine of this movie, be, be more of a corporate overlord and stuff like that, is a lot of fun. But it is very well known of what you know he is known for doing. So, in essence, he's not the most most prolific character in this movie, but he has his moments and he has a good time doing this movie and he is Mel Brooks so you got to give him credit for what credits do so some of the couple smaller villains in this movie uh of course we have Dom DeLuise who's in a lot of Mel Brooks's movies Dom DeLuise is you either love him or hate him he's kind of like Gilbert Goffrey where he has his set of comedic timing so that he's the character of Pizza Hut which is actually quite entertaining it's kind of a good gag like Colonel Sanders. There's a lot of Pepsi references in this movie because Pepsi owns uh, KFC now and, of course, Pizza Hut. So there might have been a little bit of um, uh, marketing, like bot marketing and stuff like that. But Pizza Hut is disgusting looking. You know, he has this guy named Vincent who's like uh, all gray robotic style character. But it's just a, such a great, great little moment like Jabba the Hutt where Pizza Hut wants money. That, Like I said, it's very close to the original material of Star Wars but being just enough different that we have our, you know, characters and stuff like that. So I do give a lot of credit to Dom DeLuise in this smallish role. We got uh, Steven Tobolowsky and uh, Robert DeComen, who are uh, a couple of famous comedian actors who so have bit parts in this, but they have memorable roles. Uh, Steven Tobolowsky has a pretty memorable moment in this movie where he's captured what he thinks are, is the heroes, but they end up being the stunt double, which stunt doubles, which is really funny because there's like moments where, you know, like when he turns up, when they all turn around, like the, I think the Dot Matrix character is like this guy with a you know or no it's um i'm sorry the princess vespa has it's like this guy in a wig and like this mustache is really funny and of course uh we have um uh, michael winslow who's uh the guy from police academy and does all the voices uh he also has some great moments in here where he's doing like the beeps and the bleeps and the sweeps and stuff like that he's doing the part with the jam and um, he, Mel Brooks uses him for what he's used for, which is the voice work and stuff like that. So I have to give credit to Michael Winslow, who's in this movie, but, um, that's pretty much it on the villains. Uh, like I said, they are really memorable. They are some of the best villains in comedic history. Just like I said, Rick, Rick Moranis is just, it, it's, it, it's his, it, it's his movie. It's one of his breakout character roles. So, uh, but moving on to the heroes, of course, we have, uh, Bill Pullman who, of course, was in Independence Day, not to be confused with Bill Paxton, which I do all the time. Uh, he plays Lone Star, which is a uh, mixture of Luke and, of course, Han. He's the roguish guy who doesn't really want to do anything for anybody. He's more Han than he is Luke, but he has the trajectory of a Luke, who is this guy who has a secret past that we don't really learn about until, like, later on in the movie. Uh, he has a companion who's kind of, of course, like Chewbacca, but he's a uh, Mog, uh, which is, uh, of course, played by the famous John Candy, who, uh, once again, really missed because he unfortunately did pass away a long time ago, but he's a fantastic comedic actor. Kind of, he's with the SEC TV crew as well, and like Rick Moranis, the guy is just, in this day and age, he's solely missed. He's one of those people that has such great comedic timing. He was heartfelt in a lot of things he did. And he's just a great, great actor. Just watch the stuff he's done in his past, like Home Alone and stuff like that. Uh, but he plays Barf, and of course he uh, looks like half man, half dog. He's his uh, own best friend. Uh, he's the guy that, of course, you know, is, is sticks closely behind uh, Lone Star. He probably has a ship kind of with Lone Star. He's the Han and Chewie of this movie. And I think they are so successful because they are the more grounded characters in a way. They do, especially Lone Star, who's doing the most grounded work. In essence, he is going from roguish guy who falls kind of in love with the Daphne Zerga character. And uh, he ends up finding out he's a prince, but he has to have that you know character arc, which leads him into believing that he can do what he is being destined to do, which is, uh, it is it's a typical character 
trope and stuff like that but i really like what bill Pullman is doing in here i think he's such an underrated actor uh his dry comedic timing in this movie is fantastic and i think it works because he has a sidekick and of course john candy who is doing the most more outrageous over-the-top stuff as the hero character but because those two characters two actors work so well off each other and they play like these like bumbling uh drifters or whatever who are in trouble because they owe pizza hut money i just think they have like such great chemistry together and it just works in a great way when they go from set piece to set piece to set piece when they go to res rescue the princess when they do all these things uh when of course when i said lone star finds out he's a prince it really has an effect on you that you really don't see coming which is great and of course we have daphne zuniga who plays princess vespa we have dick van patten who plays her father king roland uh king of course dick van, Pat van patten is of course a well-known legend in the comedic space he's a very talented actor uh he the stuff he's given in this movie is once again very very of his type uh, a lot of fun he plays it more grounded more level than you know, of course you know like mel brooks does but that's what dick van patten was he is what he did so he's pretty he's pretty great in this movie he has some great moments when he's trying to get his daughters you know uh vespa to marry and stuff like that and uh, of course uh princess vespa is the main heroine in this movie she is the female in distress uh she is a jewish princess which is a really funny joke in this movie about Jewish princesses and stuff like that. It's a very, uh, very Mel Brooks joke because it's a very on the nose point about Jewish people, which is uh, really kind of funny and kind of unique for what Mel Brooks is doing. He's uh, of his of his elk. He's he's willing to go there. He's like Matt Trey Parker. He's willing to do whatever it takes to have a laugh. So uh, she's basically captured, of course, as we know by uh, Dark Helmet. This is when Lone Star and Barf come to the mix. But yeah, I mean, I feel like that Daphne Zuniga and Joan Rivers have, like uh, John Candy and Bill uh, Pullman, they have this like way about how they work together really, really well. I like that this movie has pairings of actors working together, and the chemistry for all these people is really, really nicely put together. But Daphne Zuniga is, like I said, she's a heroine, but she's also very headstrong, kind of like Leia was in the movie. Uh, she, her back and forth with the Bill Pullman Lone Star character is a lot of fun to watch because she is just all up in his case about everything. But, but she is spoiled. She's always asking for daddy's help, even though she's trying to like go off on her own. She's kind of like Rachel from Friends. And this, like the farther and farther she gets away from her daddy, the more and more she becomes independent there's a point where you know she is uh holding, she's being told to hold a gun and she's holding it like this and, and she uh gets her, she gets shot in the hair which makes her really really mad she starts shooting everyone but there there's a lot of great moments with uh, daphne zuniga there's a point where like for instance the the Pullman and john candy character barf and lone star are walking through the halls of the jail cells and they hear someone singing in a baritone style voice and they realize this, that it's uh, Vespa, that she's singing like a baritone and it's really, really funny. And you know, all the luggage that she has, the fact that she has this like gigantic hair uh, dryer and stuff like that. The fact that she's so spoiled, she has like a really nice Mercedes or whatever vehicle, space vehicle. Yeah, I mean, Daphne, Daphne Zuniga's character is just, it's a fantastic, fantastic female role but she has kind of a heart to her and she ends up you know getting her prince at the end instead of marrying Mary prince valium which is pretty cool so but yeah daphne zuniga is a she's really talented in this movie which i uh, really enjoyed and uh we have uh, another character who is like the c3po of this movie who is dot matrix and uh dot matrix is played by kind of like with dom de louise uh she has a much bigger part but is played by joan rivers as the voice work there's a couple of people who like her in the suit and uh, Joan Rivers is one of the people that you're either going to love or hate as a person. I mean, it's just the way it is. It's how she is. Uh, I think she's fantastic. Her comedic timing, once again, is fantastic in this movie. She is like um, the character in uh, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, 
where she is very, uh, very protective of Princess Vespa, which is fantastic because there's a uh, virginity, virginity alarm on her uh, on her uh, plate right here that goes off every time she gets close to having uh, some kind of romantic interest in the Lone Star character. And uh, I love just how uh, how obsessive and how annoying her character gets, but I think using Joan Rivers in that role is. It, it works wonders. It really does, and that's what the that's what this whole movie does in a nutshell. You know, with well, the prince that you know that Princess Vespa is being forced to marry is a character named Prince Valium, and he can barely stay awake. And I, 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 I love that. I love I love this movie so much. It's so fantastic in what it's trying to do. And as I've talked about with these characters, the story is basically as Star Wars as it can get. You know, at the very beginning of this movie, we get a crawl. It's the most outlandish, insane crawl that can ever be read because it's so long and so ridiculous. Uh, we get into the, of course, seeing the uh, big ship, which is Mega Maid. Um, it's this long ship that has one of the most amazing introductions because as like the Star Destroyers, as they move across and you see the expanse nature of these ships, it takes, I think, about a minute for the ship to cross the whole entire uh scope of the screen and it leads into like this amazing just like moment where we finally see spaceball one which is what it's called we see what this whole working system is you know there's a zoo and there's a a store and there's a bunch of you know all kinds of crazy things that are in mel brooks's movies and like i said you know princess uh vespa gets kidnapped and of course lone star gets paid to go after her they uh, escape Space Wall 1, they land in the desert where we get another Mel Brooks character, which is uh, another fantastic comedic character, which is of course Yogurt, which is a, of course, playoff Yoda in the uh, Star Wars movies. Uh, and uh, he's all about merchandising, which is, don't, don't get me wrong, I find it really on the nose a little, little, little too much, I guess, on the nose because... He's basically pointing out the fact that the reason Star Wars is very successful is not only was the first movie that came out really good, but the merchandising did so well that it put Star Wars into another uh, another stratosphere, which is what Mel Brooks's idea behind yogurt, at least my opinion of what his idea behind yogurt is, is a character that is selling as much he's like the kiss of this universe, where he is going to sell rights to every single thing. So you see every single thing imaginable in this in this world of space balls and it's really fantastic and um of course you know there are moments where yogurt is training of course lone star kind of like in the star wars movies and there's this big statue and stuff like that he lifts statue kind of like empire strikes back princess vespa gets captured again lone star has to go after her. and you know how this movie's going to play out it, it, it leads into exactly what you're going to do but where this movie kind of hits comic gold is I think when the spaceship turns into Mega Maid. And the Mega Maid is, of course, a maid, gigantic maid, with a vacuum cleaner, which is incredibly messed up if you think about it, but is really, really funny. And it's, you know, especially in the 80s, what, what, what it's trying to do. And uh, it start, it's going to suck all the air out of the world that, of course, the druids and stuff like that live in. Um, you see like a really cool thing where all the plants are disappearing. You see Dick Van Patten's character dying and, uh, Lone Star uses his ring to kind of, you know, push down the, the from suck to blow is a really sexual reference, which I thought really, really funny. He's like Mega Man, it has gone from suck to blow, which is hilarious. There, it's a Mel Brooks film through and through how they got away with this being a PG movie. I'll never know, but uh, and they basically crash land onto whatever planet, which is an exact replica of Planet of the Apes. And they actually use a couple characters from Planet of the Apes to be the apes in the movie, which is a really nice kind of joke reference to the kind of chaos that this movie is creating. But it leads Lone Star and, of course, Barf to this cafe where, out of all the things in this movie, I really kind of iffy about. I know people love it. John Hurt, who was in, of course, Alien, is in this movie, uh, playing the exact same character he was in Alien. And the whole uh, the whole thing that's going on in this segment is it's funny. But John Hurt, of course, has the Alien chest bursting scene. And, of course, the Alien comes out and does the Hello, My Lady song that the frog from uh, the Looney Tunes does. 
and I like that sequence. I enjoy it. I you know, but I go past it. It doesn't really make me laugh that much because it's kind of too on the nose. It's being too referential to the movie it's talking about. And yes, this movie is about Star Wars, but when you do stuff like that, I don't like it as much. It's not taken away from the movie itself because the movie is a comedic piece of material but that that whole point just kind of bothered me a little bit and of course prince lone star learns that he's a prince goes marries the end of the movie and uh there's a great sequence with the you know the uh guy who's marrying valium and vespa and stuff like that and of course lone star comes in and i love that guy the you know the minister or whatever because he's very very angry because nothing's going his way like it needs to go so uh, but that's the end of the movie. That, of course, is Spaceball. It's not really that heady. It's not really that, like, complex of a movie. It's a movie about characters doing wacky stuff. It's a very Mel Brooks movie. But Mel Brooks is just this... I think after this movie, I think this and Robin Hood, uh, uh, Men in Tights, are the last great films that he ever, he ever did. I'm really shocked that this movie has a 58% on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, I don't really like Rotten Tomatoes, but I'm really shocked by that. That means 50, like 42% of the people do not like this movie. And that's pretty crazy because this movie is Mel Brooks through and through. Mel Brooks is just, he's shooting out as much comedic material as comedic timing. His script is on point beat by beat by beat. And to see that this movie is not as well liked as I always thought it was, I've enjoyed this movie since I've seen this movie more times than I've seen my favorite movies of all time. I, you know, I've seen this, Clerks, and Real Genius more times than I've seen any movies. Oh, I'm sorry, Goonies as well, more than any movie I've ever seen in my entire life because it's just a fantastic, fun time in the theater. But I was really shocked that this movie was not was well liked. It probably is the uh, same thing like History of the World Part One. It's one of those movies that I think everybody else likes, but for some reason the uh, Maybe the critics don't like. I don't know. But yeah, Spaceballs, um, just everybody in this movie does a fantastic job. There's nothing really wrong outside maybe that alien sequence that I really just cannot not complain about. I mean, I, if I were to complain about anything, I wish this movie was longer. But as they say, there's, uh, there's always too much of a good thing if you go longer than you should. Uh, but yeah, this is a Mel Brooks movie, like I said, through and through, and it's fantastic. It does everything that you would hope a Mel Brooks movie would do. And of course, you know, John Candy, I wish you could come back, but unfortunately you can't. So, you know, rest in peace with John Candy. And of course, you know, Rick Moranis, thank God he's coming back for something because, you know, he is needed in this day and age because he's such a fantastic actor. So we'll see what he does with that Honey and I Shrunk the Kids TV series or movie that's coming out. But there you go. That's my take on Spaceballs. I uh, definitely recommend it if you have not seen it. If you haven't seen it, shame on you because you, uh, especially if you like Mel Brooks, if you haven't seen it, shame. Watch it. Go watch it right now. But uh, let me know in the comments below what you think of this movie. Actually, let me know what your favorite part about this movie. Like I said, one of my favorite parts is the uh, videotape sequence. Uh, I didn't even mention like the whole uh, when they're coming to the desert and he's like, have you found anything like yet? And the guy goes, we ain't found shit. Uh, that's my favorite sequence in the entire movie because it's so hilarious. But anyways, uh, that'll do it. Hit the subscribe button, enjoy Movie Emporium. Hit that notification bell at the top to find what's coming next. And uh, comment below on any video that you watch, including this one. Otherwise, I'll see you guys on the next video. Peace out. What's up, guys? Thank you so much for checking out Movie Emporium. I really appreciate it. If you want to, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Hit the notification button and the bell at the top. Find out what's coming next for Movie Emporium. Also, check out these two videos. They're amazing. I think they're awesome. I think you'll enjoy them too. But otherwise, thank you so much for watching, guys. We'll see you next time.